Now we're looking at Matthew chapter 5 this morning. Good to see you all. God bless you. We're talking about the words written in red this year, what Jesus said. And this month we've been specifically talking about what he said about love. Now I haven't talked about all that. He talks about husbands and wives and children and all that kind of stuff. We'll get to that in a future time. When we talk about family, what he said about the family, hopefully, Lord willing. But here in Matthew chapter 5, we come to this fourth, what I'm calling a love commandment. Jesus said we should love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. The first commandment, love commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love others as yourself. The second commandment. Then last week we learned about to love one another, which is not love others as yourself, but better than yourself. Not love others as you would, but love others as I do. And that's a different thing altogether. Then we come to this passage. It's stuck flat dab in the middle of uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 43 to the end of the chapter, where he really challenges us. If it's a challenge to love God with all you got, and if it's a challenge to love others as yourself, and if it's a challenge to love others better than yourself, it's a real challenge to love your enemies. Let's read these verses beginning in verse 43. You've heard that it's been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he makes his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans the same? If you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. A couple of weeks ago, all of the newspapers and media outlets were all a buzz about the 50th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in the U.S. And I don't actually remember them arriving. I was, I was alive back then, but I don't remember them on the Ed Sullivan or anything like that. But all of us who lived during that time were greatly influenced by their music. And I got to thinking about all the love songs the Beatles did, like uh, P.S. I Love You and And I Love Her and Love, Love Me Do. And then uh, She Loves You, Yeah, Yeah, Yeah. And, of course, the last of them was uh, All You Need Is Love. And interesting about that All You Need Is Love, while they sang that song, All You Need Is Love, they weren't speaking to each other because they was about to break up. And, uh, and you think about all the love songs that's been written and all the singers that have sung them and, and all, all the time in the radio and on the charts, love is a big thing. But you've never heard anybody in your life sing the song Love Your Enemies. <laughs> But that's what Jesus is asking us to sing here. Now, he's alone in conducting us to be a choir of love to enemies. Buddha never said that. Muhammad never said that. None of the great religious teachers, even those who were somewhat pacifists, be it Gandhi or Martin Luther King, whoever, ever said, love your enemies, except in response to what Jesus said. So I just want to ask and answer real quick. Uh, five questions concerning this particular passage. Number one, what? Love your enemies. What? That's the, that's the, the idea. Uh, when Jesus says, love your enemies, the disciples would have said, what are you talking about? We often say, what are you talking about, Jesus? Love my enemies? Seriously? Have you been out too, too long in the sun, Jesus? Have you been drinking your bath water, Jesus? What do you mean, love your enemies? But that's exactly what he said. And it's a command there in the original language. It's a love commandment. Notice he said, You have heard that it hath been said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. You see, the rabbis taught at this time that you should forgive someone three times. Three strikes and you're out. And after that third time, if that person hasn't proven to be trustworthy or lovable, then you should just write them off. So you remember the story, one time Peter was talking to Jesus, and Peter kind of sides up to Jesus, and he says, Now Jesus, how often should I forgive mine enemy? Seven times? 
And Peter's feeling real magnanimous that day because he was doubling what the rabbis taught plus one. Jesus said, no, not seven, but 70 times seven. Peter like, wow, <laughs> increase my faith with what they said. And the idea was not 490 times because love doesn't keep score, 1 Corinthians 13. But the idea is that the standard procedure, the, the conventional wisdom, the consensus in rabbinic Judaism among Israelites was you do this three times and if somebody's not lovable, just write them off. And so eventually it came to be called what we see in verse 33. You heard, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Of course, that gave you the opportunity to define who your neighbor was, define who your enemy was, and decide what you was going to do about it. So you see that passage there in verse 43 where Jesus says, You've heard that it hath been said. And what had happened over a cumulative amount of time is a lot of the teaching of the Old Testament had laid it on top of it like gravy on biscuits, laid it on top of it a bunch of oral traditions and, and Pharisee teachings and rabbi teachings and, and religious teachings that was all on top of it. And that kind of became the substitute for the Word of God. So what Jesus is doing is redefining this whole thing. He said, you've heard what they say, but now I want to tell you what I say. And all throughout our lives, we have to make choices about believing what they say and doing what they say, whoever they is, or listen to what Jesus says and doing what he says. And so he says, you've heard that it had been said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemies. What? Yes, that's what he says. He, he doesn't add to it. He doesn't take away from it. He just simply makes the commandment that you and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, are to obediently submit our lives to this commandment, to love our enemies. So that brings up question number two. Who? Who are my enemies? Like, I have to tell you? <laughs> Jesus, another passage, says, sometimes our neighbors or people, we, our, our enemies, excuse me, are people we don't even know. And they attack us, or they besmirch us, or they're against us, or whatever. Other times he says our enemies are people we know very well. They could be, be in our same household. He talks about this in great detail. And it's part of the hard sayings of Jesus Christ. That right here, right now, this morning, in this church, if you were unabashedly honest, you could write down two or three names on a piece of paper of people who are against you. If you live for Jesus any time at all, you'll find people who don't like it. If you have convictions, especially in our culture today, that's gone from, in my lifetime, moral to immoral, now to amoral, if you stand up for anything that's righteous or true or holy or good, you're going to have people that's going to brand you as a prude or bigoted or intolerant or whatever. You're going to have people that's going to oppose you if you're living for Jesus Christ. We will sometimes, just in our daily routine of being faithful to the Lord, be an offense to some people. But let's make sure we're not offensive to some people. Are you with me? Just by living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, as the old song says, I'm going to rub some people the wrong way. My convictions, my stance, uh, the way I approach certain subjects is going to make people mad. But I can do that in a loving way. Just because I don't agree with this stance on this or, or this position on that doesn't mean that I hate that person and I'm against that person or those kind of people or whatever the media, the political correct crowd is throwing at us. So when I say, who are my enemies, when, when we ask that question, Jesus begins to define that. But you probably have an idea in your own walk, in your own life, who some of those people are. Satan is our enemy, but sometimes Satan walks on two legs, and he uses people against us. But now an enemy can be a positive if we see an enemy in the right way. David would have always been a shepherd boy if it hadn't been for an enemy named Goliath. Sometimes God allows an enemy to attack you, to besmirch you, to slander you, to come against you in order for you to trust him more and toughen up in your faith more and work through that trial more and see God do a greater thing in your life. So he says your enemies are those who curse you, hate you, despitefully use you. He uses several terms there, persecute you, 
Those are the people who come against us. If you're interested in studying the fascinating interplay in relationships between enemies and people, there's a great book. It's about that thick. Makes a good doorstop, too. Uh, it's called A Team of Rivals. It's about Lincoln. It was written by a lady named Doris Kearns Goodwin, and she is a, a big supporter of President Clinton back in the day, very liberal Democrat, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but that's what she was. But she wanted to write about Lincoln, and she, she says after the fact that she had her mind made up on Lincoln, but when she wrote the book, she got her mind changed on Lincoln. The premise of the book is Lincoln picked a cabinet, and in his cabinet there were people who hated him. And his advisors would say to Lincoln, why would you pick Stanton? He absolutely despises you. <laughs> Stanton called Lincoln the original gorilla <laughs> in the press in Washington. And uh, Lincoln said, I picked Stanton because he's the best man for the job. And so the whole book is about Lincoln's cabinet and how so many of them hated him, either because of who he was, the way he approached the presidency, or the whole slavery thing that was going on. But by the time Lincoln died, all the men in the cabinet were ardent lovers and supportive of him, especially Stanton, the most vocal critic, the most uh, vilified Lincoln critic. He was at the bed of Lincoln when Lincoln passed away, saying, there goes the greatest man that ever lived. But here's the story. After Goodwin got done writing the book, she says, by her own admission, Lincoln's life and the way he treated his enemies changed me, changed me. Now think about that. Here's a gal, a liberal Democrat gal, a Clintonista back in the day. She writes a book on Lincoln, hoping to expose Lincoln, and she winds up seeing the pure character of Lincoln, not the perfect character of Lincoln, but the pure character of Lincoln and how he dealt with his enemies within his very cabinet. It moved her and changed her. A Team of Rivals is the name of the book, if you're interested in history and finding out more about it. And it was Lincoln who said, I always eliminate my enemies by making friends of them. And that's what Jesus is talking about. That leads me to question number three. What? Love my enemies? Yes. Who? Who are my enemies? Those who come against me, oppose me, attack me, malign me, whatever. How will I do that? Notice what Jesus says. He gives us three very simple, practical things that we can do in our lives when people oppose us, when people are against us, people we don't even know, maybe someone we know very, very well. First notice, he says, bless them. <laughs> I like that. I know what you're thinking. He doesn't deserve it. She doesn't deserve it. That's right. You're catching on. Then he says, do good to them. And then finally he says, pray for them. And I want you to think about those three very simple, practical things in, in levels. At, at the, 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 bless you, at the, uh, at, at the most shallow of levels, now it's not shallow, but on the surface, there's a better word, we bless them. That's what we say. That's the words that we use. If someone's attacking to us, how do we respond? That's very important because our response can either mitigate against the furor or it can exacerbate the fire. Proverbs says a soft answer turns away wrath. And so if someone attacks us or comes against us or whatever, they're just out to get us, whatever the case may be, we should speak graciously to them, kindly. We should find words that will soothe them. You say, you don't know my enemy. Well, I don't, but you should attempt to do that. But that's at the very surface. Secondly, a little bit deeper, we should do good to them. That has to do not with our words, what we say, but our works, what we do. We should look for opportunity. Let's say our enemy's in the hospital. Let's say our enemy's going through a hard time. Or let's say one of our enemy's kids or grandkids is struggling with something or whatever. And we see the opportunity, and the very first thing we think is, good. <laughs> Sick him, <'em>, God. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. Don't do that. I, I know nobody here has ever done that. But anyway, when we see that, we should say, what could I do to alleviate that suffering? What could I do to help that person out? What could I do that would manifest Jesus Christ to this person, my enemy? 
Let me volunteer for something. Now, you may say, hey, could I do your laundry? Could I bring you a meal? Could I... And they may just say, no way. Well, okay. But at least be willing to investigate that. So on the surface, the words that we say, good words, gracious words, kind words to an enemy, a little bit deeper, the works that we do, something to help them, something to assist them. I've told you the story in the past of a guy we had at our church in Florida. I won't tell you in great detail, but he, but he despised me. He wouldn't let his wife and daughter come to church because of me. And, and, and one day I was going by and his grass was about this tall. And I'm not joking to you, it was about that tall. And I went up and actually knocked on the door and I said, Mr. Dean, what do you want, preacher? He said, you know, he didn't like me at all. I mean, he didn't. I, his dog didn't even like me, and that's rare. But anyway, I said, Mr. Dean, I've come to mow your grass. He said, what? I said, I've come to mow your grass. He was sick. He was ill. He couldn't do it. And uh, he didn't know what to say. And uh, we just kind of stood there looking at each other for a minute. Neither one of us is too good looking. But uh, we stood there and looked at each other for a minute and finally said, all right, preacher, there's the mower out there. Well, I figured he had a riding mower. <laughs> he didn't. But uh, I bailed hay that day. <laughs> And it was about 115 degrees in the shade down there in Central Florida, and I sweat like a stuck hog. I just mow and mow and mow, but I got it done. And you know what? It changed everything. He let his daughter come. She got saved, let his wife come. Then he had a real bad heart, and one day he called me on the phone and said, I'm going over to Leesburg, Florida to have heart surgery. And I want you to pray for me. And that was the beginning. And then another time I bought him some glasses. Anyway, it's a long story. But I, I, I've seen this in practice. What we say what we do. And finally, I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, pray for them. So at one level, the surface is what we say to people, the words that we use who are enemies to us. At a deeper level, it's the works that we do, the things that we do to demonstrate the love of Jesus. But at the very deepest level, it's praying for other people. You see, it's our will. Well, I actually bend my will at the deepest level, at the foundational level of my spiritual life, at the basement of my heart, will I get down on my hands and knees and pray for somebody who's trying to destroy me? Will I pray for somebody who's against me, who's working actively to oppose me? I'm confused, Lord. I don't understand why this person is doing this or why these people are like this, but God, God I'm going to get down right now. I'm going to pray that you bless them. I'm going to pray that you do something good in their life. I'm going to pray that you change their heart of their life. See, that's our will. That's our will. Because you can say sweet things every once in a while when you hear them, but that won't last. And you can do something nice for somebody that hates your guts, but when they don't do it back, you'll get mad. You'll get bitter. You'll resent them. You'll say, well, I tried. But, the, but at the deepest level, can we go down in the basement of our heart and get on our face before Almighty God and cry out for people like that? That's what it's about. So how do I do it? I bless them. I do good to them. I pray for them. And then question number four, verse 45. Why? <laughs> Jesus says, love your enemies. Why? Why? <laughs> Jesus says to the disciples, love your enemies. Peter says, why? <laughs> and so do we so many times. When God says, you know, that person there that's attacking you, or antagonistic to you, messing with your business, wants to see you fail, wants to destroy you, I want you to love that person. We say, why? Well, here it is, verse 45. That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. That's it. We don't love enemies to get them off our back. We don't love enemies so they'll be nice to us. That's too low a goal. We love enemies that we may show everybody that we belong to the Father. That's why we do it. Now this word for children here, you may have a new version that says sons. There are three Greek words for child. Stay with me now. One means a newborn. Okay. One means... Uh, a toddler, we get pediatrics from that word, but this word he uses is full-grown son or mature person, that you may be the mature or the maturing person, child of the father. 
When Jesus is called in the scriptures, son of God, it's always this word. Never little baby, except when he was a baby physically, or growing toddler kind of person. Jesus is always looked at as the, the mature son of God. Character, integrity, fidelity, loyalty, dependency, consistency. Jesus was the man. And so what he's saying here is through this process of loving your enemies, those who oppose you, those who are against you, you are going to grow up and become more and more the child, the son, the daughter that God has saved you to be. See, we can get down in the sandbox and beat each other up. You know, the enemy comes against us, and so we'll just, we'll just take him out. We'll just duke her out. We'll just bless them out. We'll just kick them out. We can live our lives like little children on the playground, or we can grow up. And so this is what he's talking about here, that you may be that you may become. And I was talking to a guy this week. He doesn't go to this church. I was visiting in the home. I've known him for a long, long time. And he said to me, Brother Rob, he said, I think you're getting taller, he said. And I said, that's just good posture. And uh, he said, you know, I've lost three inches since I got out of high school. He said, I'm three inches shorter now than I was back in 19... <laughs> and I got to thinking about that. When you look at verse 45, are we getting older and growing smaller, spiritually speaking? Are you and I, are us and we, getting older in the Lord, but at the same time growing smaller in the Lord? It is possible to know the Lord a long, long time and yet get smaller and smaller and smaller in the things that Jesus says we ought to get larger and larger and larger in us. Yeah. So he says in verse 45, God makes the rain the sun on everybody just the same. And then he says this in verse 46. If you just love them that love you, what reward is that? See, it's not just growing up into the Father, but it's receiving rewards from the Father. There's something uh, eternally, mysteriously satisfying about just obeying the Lord and loving whoever he puts in your life. There's a reward there. There's something. It's like I said about, about, about Mr. Dean, the, the guy with the grass, remember? Uh, you know, the, the first time I actually went in his house and sat down, he turned his chair completely around. I mean, it was weird. <laughs> I mean, how many times you'd go to somebody's home to talk to them, they turn the chair completely, what, what do you do with that? It's just weird. But uh, eventually, you know, things happened, and one day he showed up in these three-piece uh, blue, uh, what's those suits they had back in the 70s? The leisure suit, yeah, you knew, didn't you? <laughs> See, there's a reward there, something satisfying to see a man and his wife and his daughter sitting in the church, singing the songs when six months, a year ago, he cussed you to the face. Something satisfying about that. And the Lord is saying those kind of rewards are available to us who will not ask why, but just say yes. Why should I love my enemy? Yes, Lord, I will love my enemy, you see that I may be the child of the Father and that He may reward me in kind as He does the work in the lives of our enemies. And finally, number five, verse 48, when? When should I love my enemies? Well, how about now? <laughs> no time like the present. And that's what He says. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven which is which in heaven is perfect. Now, perfection is not sinlessness but Christ's likeness. Perfection is Jesus moving towards Him, becoming more like Him. Not sinless perfectionism in that sense, but a Christ-likeness that reflects Him. Become, be in the process, verse 48, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven, which is imperfect. Now i got two minutes left, okay? So real quick, don't laugh. i got two minutes left. Jot down three or four thoughts I had about 5.30 this morning I wanted to share with you concerning this. Number one, affection is the path to perfection. 
we think, well, if I just read my Bible more, if I just pray more, if I just attend church more, if I just give a bigger offering, or if I just... Do, but and those things have their place. But Jesus is telling us that affection is the path to perfection. It's lover's lane. <laughs> as I love God, as I love others, as I love others like He loves them, as I love my enemies, I'm moving more and more towards this perfection or this Christ-likeness that he talks about. So affection is the path to perfection. Number two, I've got to say this. Loving our enemies is both unnatural and supernatural. I get that. When I love my enemy, it's the weirdest feeling in the world because I want to take his head off. <laughs> See, there's just enough old man left in this skinny preacher to want to slap somebody around and repent later. <laughs> Don't do that. So loving my enemy is an unnatural thing. It feels weird. You know, it's not do unto others, but get them first. You know, that kind of a thing. But it's also supernatural. When I am loving the enemy, whoever that person is, I know it's not me, but it's Jesus in me, you see. So loving enemies is both unnatural and supernatural. Number three, to love only those that love you is not love, but expanded selfishness. To love only those who love you is not love at all. Just expanded selfishness, you see. Jesus said that's what the publicans and the Democrats, that's what they all do. <laughs> I love you because I know you're going to love me back. I'm going to scratch your back because you're going to scratch my back. I'm going to give to you because you're going to give to me. And we get into this unconscious, I believe, not intentional, but unconscious pattern of living. We get up on Sunday and, and we, you know, we, we eat the same breakfast and we get in the same car and we park in the same place and we sit in the same pew and we speak to the same three people and we go out and do that week after week after week after week. We just love the people that love us back. We just talk to the people who we know. And, and God says we're missing a great opportunity, but the insidious byproduct of that approach to Christian life and relationships is really I'm just expanding my own selfishness, my own comfort zone, my own level of mediocrity, and ultimately my own lukewarmness. How about if I go love somebody who's unlovely? How about if I go love somebody who's nasty? How about if I just listened to Jesus long enough to go mow somebody's grass who hates me? What would happen? <laughs> I'll tell you what would happen. Change your life. <laughs> Been there, done that, could write the book. Still doing it. <laughs> so the last thing I want to share with you, number four, the world will never be converted by love, but the world must be confronted by love. Now listen to me again. Jesus tells us to love, 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 but he reminds us that our love is never going to convert the whole world, but our love must confront the whole world. They've got to see this love of God. They've got to get it through us. They've got to see it in us. They've got to hear it from us. It may not win everybody, but it doesn't exonerate us from our responsibility to go to those unlovely places and those unlovely people and love them in Jesus' name. So although the world will never be converted by the love of God, it must be confronted. Because as you've heard me say several times over the past few weeks, and I'm done, love is the one argument for Christianity for which there is no other argument. They can argue about this. They can argue about who was Cain's wife. They can say, can God make a rock so big he can't pick it up? They can talk all, all. But when you love people, there's no argument with that. It's like, what? I like to paraphrase verse 44 by saying, love your enemies and really mess with their heads. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the love commandments. Each of us here, needs to hear the love commandments. Love God with all you got. Love others as yourself. Love others better than yourself. Love one another as I've loved you. And love your enemies. And Lord, whoever our enemies are, each of us may have two or three people, maybe somebody in our family, maybe somebody we work with, 
Maybe somebody, just a total stranger that's just got it out for us. I don't know. But if we try to live for Jesus any time at all, there are going to be people that's not going to like it for whatever reason. And uh, that's unfortunate, but that's how it is. And so, Lord, you tell us, whoever those people are, that we're to bless them. We're going to say certain words. We're going to do good to them. We're going to pray for them. And uh, we're going to allow you to do what only you can do as we submit to your authority. None of us wants an enemy. None of us gets up every morning and say, hey, I think we'll make three enemies today. That's not our purpose in this life. But it happens sometimes, and when it does, you tell us to love them and to allow you to do your work in their lives, Father. I know in my own life down through the years, it just fascinated me. I just being a preacher, some people hate you before they ever meet you for one reason or another. And that's always been a difficult thing for me to deal with personally, Lord, because I'm just not a confrontational kind of guy. But I've been in many situations where I just realized pretty quick that half the room was ready to lynch me just because of the P word. <coughs> and sometimes just because of who we are, without anybody even knowing anything about us, they've already made up their minds against us. And when we sense that, what do we do? How do we respond? How will we uh, glorify you in a moment like that. Well, Lord, it's very simple. We demonstrated it early this morning when we had the Lord's Supper. We <clears throat> see it over here in the sanctuary at the cross. At times like that, we simply have to die. We just have to die. We can't defend ourselves. <coughs> we can't retaliate. We can't go behind somebody's back and try to prove this or defend that. No, at times like that, we believers, we who are growing up into the fullness of Christ, we just have to die. We just have to go to the cross and allow you to deal with the hurt that we feel, the heart that is broken, the burden that comes on us when somebody's against us, and we just have to die. But you promise us in that moment of relinquishing the temptation to become judge, to become God, to defend ourselves. When we let go of that at that moment, there's something of Jesus that happens in us that could happen no other way. As I said, it's unnatural and it's supernatural. And in that moment, that instant, you do something transforming in our hearts, in our minds, and we become more like your son. It's amazing. It's fantastic. And you do it. Help each of us this week even to pray about this, to consider this. We can dance around this like we're dancing around a porcupine and never get stuck. We can talk about it. We can read the scriptures. But we can never get around to it because we've learned how to live without getting around to it. And yet it doesn't change the fact that you've told us, you've commanded us to love our enemies. Help us to go and do that this week. Todd, what number will we say? 312. Would you stand? Number 312 is our hymn of decision, our hymn of commitment. 312, if you need to come as we sing, you come. 312. <clears throat>
Move on the cross, take each other by the hand. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Thank you for your attention this morning, your attendance this morning. Father, we're so thankful and grateful that we have a God like you that loves people like us. <laughs> and we're so thankful that the love that you put into our heart, we can share with others that need to receive the love of God. And we know that love is patient and love is kind. Love thinks no evil thoughts, as Paul says. Love is believing all things and hoping all things and enduring all things. And out of faith, hope, and love, he tells us the greatest of these is love. So we're thankful, Father, that this idea of loving and being loving is something that's not outside of the potential for anybody in this room. And we can make choices every single day to love the enemies, to love the others, to love you as you give us the love. For what you require, you always provide. You're a God who's so good and so gracious as to be great. And we thank you for it. Now dismiss us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a good afternoon.